You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Dear Culture, the podcast for by and about the culture here on the Griot Black Podcast Network. I'm your host, Panama Jackson, and today we are going to talk about a movie that has upset many people that is making the rounds right now that I, I don't know. We just got to have a conversation about another movie that's out there right now. The American Society of Magical Negroes. What's the most dangerous animal on the planet? Shark. White people, when they feel uncomfortable. White people feeling uncomfortable precedes a lot of bad stuff for us. That's why we fight white discomfort every day. Because the happier they are, the safer we are. And because we've had a conversation here on Dear Culture before about Magical Negroes, and that was a convo about Magical Negroes versus White Saviors, I decided the only possible way to have this conversation about this movie was to bring back the homie, author, cultural commentator, uh, writer, all the things, and the host of the Griot Daily Podcast here on the Griot Black Podcast Network, Michael Harriet. How you doing today, Michael? Great. I'm great, man. I'm excited about talking to you about this movie. All right. I'm glad. So let's, let's just hop right into this. The movie, The American Society of Magical Negroes, is a movie about a young, light-skinned black dude who has no backbone and is very deferential to white people, effectively. And a magical Negro sees him and wants him to be a magical Negro because I'm not exactly sure why he thinks he'd be good at this, but he brings him into the society of magical Negroes, which you get to through a barbershop um, somewhere in L.A., and... They teach you how to be a magical Negro, which the entire goal is to appease and pacify white people. Y'all, just take a look at the trailer for this movie real quick. Watching you walk through a room full of white people was the most painful thing I've ever seen. Excuse me. Sorry. I don't want to take you to a job interview. There's a recruiting class starting right now, and we got to get you in it. Welcome to the American Society of magical Negroes. Yeah, it's actually fun and weirdly relaxing. It's like being a secret agent with none of the danger. Hey, I'm Lizzie. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. She's great. Yeah, she's cool. You kidding? Come on, man. She's smart and funny. I know what you were doing going on about her. You're trying to set us up. No, 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 that's not what I was doing. You cannot have a relationship with Lizzie now because if you don't put Jason first, everyone's magic will fail. It devolves into this movie that's really not the magical Negro movie. It's more a rom-com slash black man um, rude awakening moment that he gets to make some big speech that doesn't really fit with what we've seen in the movie. And then it ends on the rom-com type thing, right? So it doesn't, you know, so I'm, I'm with like the, the movie itself, while I enjoyed it, I didn't hate it as much as like a lot of critics do. I also acknowledge that what this movie is, is not sure of itself either. Before I get into the reviews, what were your first, what were your impressions of the movie after it was over? The fir- my first impression was, I don't know who it was for. Uh, it wasn't a movie for black people, and we can get into that. And I don't think like white people, because you know we both cover media, and we know that like white people don't s- go necessarily go see movies with black leads about black topics. So I didn't know who it was for, and specifically, I don't know why anyone would have left their house and paid money to go see this movie, right? Like, that's what I was trying to figure out. I would have watched it, like, if if I was in a hotel room and HBO was on and it came on, I probably would have watched it, but I don't know why anyone would have gone to a theater to see this movie. To be fair, I I was looking forward to going to see this in theaters. Now, mostly because I just didn't want to wait for it to hit streaming, so I wanted to see it. The title got me. The American Society of Magical Negro sounds like a movie... 100% 100% written and built for the Panama Jackson wheelhouse. Whatever that is, this movie sounds like it's made for me, right? But I do agree. When I went to go see it, I enjoyed it. Like, I, I enjoyed the movie. I, I laughed out loud a couple times. I, I even mentioned to you that there were choices made in this movie that I would have made if I was making about a movie about magical Negroes. 
Now, it's literally all this stuff specifically about Magical Negroes, not the the rom-com part of it. Is it fair to say this is like multiple movies in one that kind of loses its way somewhere or maybe the movie isn't sure of what it is to begin with? Yeah, I think that's that's the problem with this movie is it isn't anything. It isn't a romantic comedy um, because there's really no romance. Um, <laughs> and the comedy part is never with like the white people. Uh, and and the, one of the things I have to quibble with is like, first of all, the main character, they insinuate that he's biracial. There's a point where he says, like, my right. mom is white. And so he isn't really magical and he isn't all the way Negro, um, which is like weird, a weird choice to make. And I don't even know if it's that he you never get the sense that he's unsure of himself around white people. He seems that he's just unsure of himself. Unsure, like yeah. he doesn't seem comfortable around, like he's not around black people comfortably. And so you don't get that sense. Like he changes when he's around white people. It's like they just picked a, a guy who's unsure of himself. And we're supposed to think that's because of the white people. He just seems like a guy who is unsure of himself in every circumstance. Like there's no, cir there's no circumstance that he's going to be in where he's not going to like, fade into the background like that homer simpson meme fading into the trees like that's just his personality the david allen greer who's like i don't know if he, he's like the the second in charge head magical negro of some sort like i don't know if he's just a like a he just tenured as like a really long-term magical negro whatever like he's just, you know he's he's good i enjoy him in the movie but he's also like i read a review that called him like a jolly like jolly black man and i really then i saw him that way i'm like they really could have used David Allen Greer a little bit better. He's the perfect person to do. Like if they would have just let David Allen Greer go, he would have been perfect in that role, which we'll get into later. But the thing about the 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 character of David Allen Greer and the dude is like there's not enough of either one of them to really care about them uh, in any way. Right. Like you don't know anything about the main character, except that he's kind of black and that's it. Right. Um, so th that's that was one of the problems with the movie. But the main problem is like it would have been an all right movie if it was about anything else other than magical Negroes, because the problem is they burned that whole uh, idea. They burned this whole premise or nothing, like they wasted it. And now you can't make any, move, any movies about magical Negroes because they wasted it on this mess of a movie. So I, I both agree with you and disagree, but the disagree part is we're going to end up having to make a better magical Negro movie and we can get back to that. But one of the things that we, do we actually think that the, the magical Negroes are making the world a better place? Like, do we think that these magical Negroes are making any of the white people ultimately better people? Or that because that's another issue that I had. I don't think the, the magical Negroes were, were in any way, shape or form making white people better. They were just helping white people be OK, which is also a very flawed premise in terms of making the world a better place, which is one of the criticisms I saw. People like this, this entirely like dismisses the revolutionary black people. But I'm like, it's also a satire. You kind of got to take some liberties with that stuff. I, I think I think the the biggest uh, thing about the form of racism that this movie presented that they were trying to fix is that that form of racism is not what black people care about and it's not what white people are ever going to see, right? Like, I have a theory that this movie was pitched like, like the day after George Floyd and somebody made it, somebody was like, yeah, we're in a racial reckoning. And then it got greenlit and the form of racism that they pointed out was the scariest form of racism that white people were able to see and not the systemic issues. And that's basically what like you were talking about. Right. right. Like it didn't stop racism. It didn't stop the systemic stuff. It didn't stop like white people from even being mean. It just it rests on the premise that if white people were comfortable there would be less racism. Which is ridiculous at all. So let me read a couple reviews 
about this movie because this movie has been panned fairly universally by like everybody. Let me tell you something right now. Don't do this again. We're left with a narrative that skims the surface and doesn't fully commit to exploring the real magic that could have come from tackling such a complex issue head on. I don't think that I've seen a good review of this yet. In fact, had I seen this movie in advance, I probably would have written the best review of it, but it would have been purely in response to the extreme negative reviews that I saw. Like it wouldn't have been about the movie. It would have been about the extremes with which I think people were writing. So for instance, there's this, the first review that I think all of us saw was written by Robert Daniels on RogerEbert.com, where he gave it one star. And this is his first paragraph. Um, I wish I could erase the American Society of Magical Negroes from my mind, but the universe doesn't possess enough fairy dust to make such miracles possible. It lacks form, edge, politics, coherency, and a grand vision necessary for vast world building. Um, basically, he says it sucks. From Rotten Tomatoes, it's got 30% on the tomato meter. The audience score is 65%, though, so that's not bad. Um, Aisha Harris, who is a pop culture writer, uh, had, had this to say, so many disparate ideas and tones are being mashed up here, and none of them gel. Basically saying this movie sucks, too. Now, what's really funny is here's a review from what I assume is a white guy on the Bounding Into Comics website. Jacob uh, from Jacob Smith. Jacob is the editor and founder of Society Reviews, a right wing Christian film critic and entertainment commentator who is mean to Hollywood 95.4 percent of the time and has written almost a thousand movie reviews. He says this about the movie. The American Society of Magical Negroes is probably the most racist film to come out in recent time. Still, its biggest sin is being one of the most boring movies in the last several years with one of the worst actors in Hollywood given the responsibility to lead this movie. So there's, there's uh, black people and white people hate this movie. In the world of romantic comedies, it's like a fairly adequate romantic comedy, right? Um, it's, it has all the romantic comedy tropes. So what do you think is the point of this movie? The point of the movie ended up being like white people ain't that bad and black people you know, I don't know, right? Like, I don't even know what the point is. That's one of the criticisms of the movie is, like, it really had no point. Um, it missed every opportunity to make a point. And inside of it, they made some really nuanced, good choices that were bookended by, like, one of my biggest criticisms of the movie is that its idea of racism is white people's idea of racism. like, like. At every point they make a point to say like, well, we could be shot by the police as if that's the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest concern of black people with racism. But inside of those book, even though those are bookends of the movie inside of those, they make a really good point about allyship, about privilege. And, and those choices make the movie interesting and give some nuanced uh, point, bring out some nuanced characteristics of the movie, even though. At every chance, they they revert back to, but you know, we could be shot, we could be killed, and racism is really scary, which is never black people's point. And it's the idea of racism that white people have and not black people. Yeah. You know what I thought was really good that they did was, so the white character, I forget his name, the white, the white main character for whom Aaron is his magical Negro, like they do a really good job with using him to explain privilege the idea that white people think meritocracy is a thing well i got this opportunity so i must deserve this opportunity like they did a really good job having him explain his whiteness and white privilege you know and he did it several times in several different instances where i was like that was actually really well done even at the point where so one thing that's at the center of this of this movie is they work at a company called meatbox which is a social media app, like the most popular social media app on the planet. And the white guy has is on the team that builds facial recognition software that doesn't recognize black people. If you spend any time online, remember this was a thing a while ago. There's all these concerns about like, I don't know if it was face, but whoever it was like the facial recognition thing wasn't recognizing 
people who are darker than a certain complexion and stuff like that. So in this movie, then they make this whole thing about how the entire nation of Ghana is unrecognizable. Like on, so it was, I laughed out loud. They called it Ghana gate. Like they interviewed a guy in Ghana. who was like, well, on the good side, I'm more productive than ever on the bad side. I can't actually get on, you know, to check my profile. Card. Like I laughed out loud at some of that stuff because it's so absurd that it's hilarious. And it does a good job of like lampooning certain things. The point that I took away from it, because it's the one that I wanted to take away, was I really enjoyed the Magical Negro stuff. Like, I really enjoyed the way that they demonstrated Magical Negroes, and they kind of made fun of the Bagger Vance thing, and then um, John Coffee from, you know, like, John Coffee from the Green Mile. Like, they literally spoofed them. This whole thing would have been awesome if they leaned 100% into these black people going out to be Magical Negroes, and how ridiculous some of that stuff looks. Like, there was a whole blindside thing just waiting for them to, like, waiting for them to do. Like, the Wayans brothers were missing from this movie. You know what I'm saying? Like, the Wayans brothers were missing from, from this thing. You know, one of the things I really liked was the conversation in the cab with the woman, Aaron's conversation with her, and she's apologizing for, like, really what was essentially not being an ally. Yeah. And I, I know he was being racist and I know I didn't speak up. And you kind of got to see why white people don't speak up in those um, incidents. But um, and that was a really nuanced conversation. I really liked that. And but they always reverted to. But, you know, the police can kill me. Um, and, and, and they kind of ruined the whole thing. Yeah. All right. So. I I think what you just said, and I think the kind of the point here is this for me. The stuff about the magical Negro thing, all of those were really great sketches that if they put together in a movie would have been wonderful, right? It was like a wonderful sketch comedy version. Like they were doing the tailoring room for the magical Negroes and all this stuff, like costuming and, you know, all this stuff. It was always when it went from being a sketch comedy to a movie. It's when they were trying to toggle the two that I think it kept losing me if it lost me. I was entertained. So, you know, for me... Usually entertainment is what I'm going for. But when it took the swings, I do think it missed. The best moments were the er absurd moments. And when it just tried to be a real movie about a love story that they weren't necessarily in love, uh, it got lost. Right. All right. So we're going to take a real quick break here. And when we come back, I think we're going to try to make this movie better. Uh, you know, we... Michael and I had a conversation about what would have been a better version of this movie. And there's no challenge that Michael Harriet can't can't meet. So I think we might have gotten a better version of this movie on deck. So stay tuned right here on Dear Culture. It's the secret story you haven't been told. Good morning, comrades. The Harlem Renaissance and the Soviet Union. Renowned poet Langston Hughes and some of his Harlem Renaissance friends were given the opportunity of a lifetime to travel to the Soviet Union to make a movie. We are here to do something grand, and we must look the part. But not just any movie. A communist propaganda film for a black American audience. The project is meant to inspire a revolution here. If Russians believed in our revolution, nothing can stop us. Young, black, and free to enjoy life without rigid rules on race and sex. They do not do this sort of thing in Boston. Sure they do. They just don't invite you. But trouble soon followed. How are we supposed to make a world-class film with a bunch of amateurs? No! Give it back now! She took a drink from a bottle thinking it was wine. Turns out it was formaldehyde. <gasps> this trip was lost to time. Until now. Harlem in Moscow is an audio drama based on the true story of this pivotal moment in black history. Join us for the exciting adventure to the Soviet Union. The Revolution! <laughs> what was that? Listen to Harlem in Moscow, starring Grammy Award-winning poet and producer Jay Ivey on the Grio Black Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Starting on March 25th. All right. We've been screwed. And we're back. You mentioned that you you fit you like rewrote the movie in some way. But did your rewriting require you to like make a different movie or was it taking parts of this movie to make it better? 
bro, I rewrote this same, like the same characters, the same, you know. So, first of all, yeah, I got to go into a little, uh, like one of the things that my biggest problem with this movie is there is, and I don't even want to sound too uh, Umarish right now, <laughs> but there is this thing, there is a, a thing that we know that we see in the movie industry where there is a form of black masculinity that is comfort, it makes white people comfort, comfortable, right? Like the guy who is not um, sure of himself, who does that stutter talk that, uh, you know, is awkward, is a little nerd, and is like kind of adjacent to whiteness but it's still black and that doesn't offend or like make white people uncomfortable. And we see this kind of lead all of the time. So in my version of the movie, we erase one, we just recast that guy. Right. And we make him a Umar type, right? <laughs> so it's the same character, same name, same guy, but he is, one of those Umar types, and he has been sentenced to be a magical Negro by David Allen Greer, <laughs> who has the same background, right? Fell in love, he got in trouble with the Society of Magical Negroes, and now to keep his job, he has to recruit this Umar type into the Society of Magical Negroes. He has the same assignment, but the comedy in the movie comes from he wants to go full Umar every time on this white dude, and he has to suppress himself because he, he has to keep his magical Negro job, right? And like that lends itself to way more comedy, right? Because black people will identify with, man, I want to, I just, he goes home right. wanting to slap this dude every day, right? Like he's black all of the time, except for when he has to be at work, which is- The American condition, different right? from this movie, because this dude was the same dude at home, it was the same dude in the art gallery. He was like, it wasn't like, you didn't see how he reacted around black people versus white people. But in my movie, this dude wants to, like he has to restrain himself from, from saying, first of all, you know, I, what we ain't gonna do. Like he has to restrain himself all of the time. And so he goes home where he can be black around his friends, but when he's at this magical Negro nine to five, he has to appease these white people, which like it kind of gives not just more comedy, right? But it's kind of an analogy for how black people exist in the world in reality too. And it shows like it, it highlights the trope that we're talking about, right? And so that to me, <laughs> That's a much better uh, movie, and you can still have the. I don't know what's the what's the love interest white. No, she. Well, remember the guy says she's ethnic. I didn't even realize she was ethnic. Right. So that's what he says. In the <laughs> but 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 that also gives conflict to the Umar type. I, I think I'm falling in love with this white girl, but in my movie, she's not ethnic, right? She is a black woman passing as white. So hmm. when she loses the big presentation, she has to choose between revealing that she's black so she can be in the room just like, like Aaron was in the room, or would you rather these people think you were still white? Hmm. Right? Like, would you rather lose the presentation because you are a woman or, you, or let them know that you're black? I think she's going to say, I don't want them to know that I'm black. Now nah, we're not going to tell them, which is more in depth because you look at like feminism versus right. racism. Like it's a, just a better movie if you make the girl pass. All right. I, I have one question. I, the, the first question, why was the Umar like character sentenced to be a magical Negro? And is that how you become one? You are forced into magical Negro dumb because of like what? What do you have to do to be forced into the American Society of Magical Negroes in your world? This sounds like a penalty. Well, just like in this movie, he has failed at everything else. He's an artist. He doesn't have a job. He needs money. And this dude presents him a job, right? And 
you know, because he's a black revolutionary Umar type, he wants to help this brother out. He wants to help this brother keep his job, right? Like he's about the collective economic responsibility. And in essence, is it the American society of magical Negroes, a black owned business? <laughs> it is a black owned, it should be. It should be. So yeah. And he, he gets to help fight racism from inside. Plus you get magic. So what if, what if, I'm going to take you back on this one. You remember the movie Drop Squad? I love Drop Squad, yes. What if that's how you become a magical Negro? The Drop Squad comes to get you and runs you through your stuff, and then you have to go serve a couple years as a magical Negro to, like, really, like, <laughs> you got to, like, you got to be woke through your, through, through trying to help black people in this capacity. Like, that's like the drop squad comes to get you, and then you end up over here. Now, I don't, now the Dr. Umar part would be difficult, though, because you can't, he's already, he's been drop squatted. So, so like, he's the, 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 the logo representation. Like, he's like the NBA logo of the drop squad would be Dr. Umar. But I'm trying to, like, because I like the idea of being sentenced to be a magical Negro. Like, that, that, that fascinated me immediately. Like, somehow you end up here instead of, Wherever else. I love that idea. I don't... Yeah, I, I like that. I like the drop squad idea, too. I like the drop squad idea. What if if the society of magical Negroes manages to change enough white people? Their goal is if we change enough white people and make white people see racism and feel comfortable. We get reparations. Oh, I'm about to blow your mind. Here's the here's the flip to that. This is where the movie gets its tension and drama. If you save enough white people, then racism ceases to exist, but then they're all out of a job. So you got a rogue magical Negro who is trying to keep white people racist so that they can all stay employed and think and stay in business. Like the head of the magical Negroes is like, I actually got to ensure that we have a reason to exist so we can't really save these white people. So I got to put plants in here somewhere to keep racism alive. Then you got, Ooh, now you got a serious. magical Negro mold. Magical Ooh, Negro yeah, I like mold. that. Yeah. See, this movie's already yeah. better than the one I, I like to go that. see. I like that. If they, if they solve the problem, then they're all out of a job. Right. Right. And you know, man, I feel like we have to do this because I feel a little responsible. You know, the audience should know, like, years ago, I wrote an article called The School for Magical Negroes that, that kind of outlined how to become a magical Negro. So I think we got to make this movie, man. Um, we got to, I don't know, we, first of all, we got to uh, erase the memory of this, this current movie <laughs> because, again, they burned the trope, which is, is the saddest part about this movie is that they wasted that premise on this movie. I mean, it did like 1.3 million at the box office. It's fine. We, you could make a movie next year with the exact same title, which, you know, no shots to the writer and director, but I mean, you know, unfortunately, the version of the movie that that was made doesn't seem to be resonating. And pay, perhaps the bad press helped with that extensively. Time for a quick break. Stay with us. I've always felt like it's my job to make white people feel comfortable. And here it literally is. But maybe it shouldn't be. All right, we're back here on Dear Culture. We're talking about the American Society of Magical Negroes. I'm joined by Michael Harriet, And we've been talking about the movie itself and, like, the pro. I think we've kind of been, like, streamlining the problems that this movie has, right? Like, just in general, the places where it falls flat. You know, I wanted to talk about some of the good things. I did think it's funny in parts. But one of the major, like, plot holes of this movie, too, is the very thing that this movie rests on doesn't actually make sense in the grand scheme of things. The main client in the movie, the, the white person who, was, who they were trying to make feel good, uh, there was no point to making him feel good. Like, right. even, like, he wasn't like a police officer who could have killed someone. He was just a white guy who worked at a white company surrounded by other white people. So even though he was having problems, his problems weren't necessarily related to race. It wasn't necessarily re related to romance. It was like if the magical Negro in this movie didn't exist, he would have been all right. 
black people would have been all right. The whole regular universe would have been all right. So I don't understand the point of having this high stakes game. The stakes weren't high enough because saving him wouldn't help anyone. Yeah, I don't actually understand what made him uncomfortable. So what they what they had, what magical Negroes are able to see is like an uncomfortability meter for their white clients. Right. They can take a look and there's like a little clock thing that 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 is a pendulum that swings on the uncomfortability meter. And if somebody's too uncomfortable, they get sent there to help appease them or, or bring them back to a reasonable level of, of, of comfort. But in this case. Even the thing that seen, that you would think would make him uncomfortable, which was failing at the task at his job, he didn't seem to care that much. Like, he was like, I thought about it for a few minutes and I just got over it because I did my best. So, you know, like his goal was to ascend to the rank, like to be seen by the, the CEO, like the, the crazy uh, Australian like owner of, of Meatbox, whatever. He was trying to get to his level, but his discomfort didn't really seem to be anything that a magical negro would need to fix or really be able to fix because it had nothing to do with the rest of society for like he didn't care about the facial recognition thing he was like i did my best it is what it is right you know that was elon musk right like it was australian elon musk and like fixing him wouldn't have solved it like fixing elon musk won't solve anything for black people right um like we might twitter might be a little bit better but it wouldn't fix anything. And the same thing was in this movie. Like, I don't know why there was so much effort put into this white guy. And that was ultimately the biggest plot hole and the fault of the movie. Like, you didn't care about him achieving his goal because at the, if he achieved it, nothing would have been better. Right. In, in some way, Aaron, the, the magical Negro, giving this speech where he realized that he's black, like for the past week, he's realized what is blackness and how the white world has like been a burden to him, blah, blah, blah. He gives this whole speech that kind of comes out of nowhere. Like it doesn't seem like it makes much sense for him to give that speech, but the white guy, I guess, sees him for the first time, but I actually do not believe that would change a thing. Like, I think for the moment he heard him was like, wow, you have these feelings and see these things, but I have no reason to believe that particular white guy is going to change at all. Like there's, I don't believe he's going to go out and try to become an ally or try to make sure that he is viewing himself through the lens of his privilege. Like none of that. I think he just walked off stage and was like, I got yelled at. Wow, that hurts. Yeah. And even if he did, how does that make anything better? Right. Like, let's say he realized from the speech, wow, the racism was inside me the whole time. What changes? Right. Like if he became an anti-racist crusader nothing would have changed he's just a yeah. dude that worked at a tech company if anything that is probably the biggest flaw of the movie that part makes no sense like the 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 very reason the movie exists makes no sense in terms of the actual outcome for black people time for a quick break stay with us and we're back but let me, so let me ask you a question though about this. Like, should people see it? Like, is this a movie worth going to see? Going to see? I uh, I think no. But seeing, like, if it's like this, would have been an I right Netflix movie. Like, if I was just scrolling through Netflix and saw this and watched it, I wouldn't be mad. Like, I don't know how you get people to go to the theater to see this, right? Um, aside from David Allen Greer, right? Like, I'd go see David Allen Greer. And things, but I don't know about going to the movie theater to see it. But if it's if it's on a streaming service or like just on HBO one night when when you're scrolling or changing the channels, I think you just watch it. Just like like you watch. It wasn't as bad as like I watched stuff like Four Hundred Days of Summer, <laughs> which was like a romantic right. comedy that kind of didn't make sense. Like there's a bunch of romantic comedies i've seen just because they were on at the time and i'm like i oh, i watched this oh also this is a sidebar were there any other black people in this movie that weren't magical negroes that's my thing right like there were no black people in the real world it was all they were was one of my questions was were all the negroes magical like was this dude the only non-magical negro in the movie he's the only one left in los angeles 
Huh. Yeah. What if all the black people were magical Negroes and he was just like his white side had like uh, <laughs> rendered him magicless? It took them a while to find him. You know one other thing that they never explained? Do, do magical Negroes ever die? Because like the thing they ins insinuated that Nick, David Allen Greer, his failure as a magical Negro was like in the 1800s, right? So like do, does becoming a magical Negro mean you're immortal? So, and you know, if they, you're immortal, they, then why do you need more magical Negroes? They talked about that a bit because remember they said that that magical Negroes have increased the life expectancy of black people by like five years. Um, and the life expectancy of magical Negroes was on par of that of white people. But I wonder if that's after you get set back to being a regular Negro, like because they have a costume department that could literally put you in any time period. Right. So. That is a good question. What are your final thoughts about this as we wrap up this episode? Well, my final thought is it's not as bad as the reviews I've seen, but it's not good. It's not bad enough to hate watch, and it's not good enough to make it uh, appointment viewing or go see in the theaters. Uh, but if you stumble across this movie, I don't think you'll be mad. Yeah, I think where I land with this is it's not as bad as the reviews make it out to be. It's also not worth me defending the movie against the bad reviews. My real feeling on that is if somebody, when people give it a bad review, I can understand where that bad review right. comes from. I couldn't understand where someone would be coming from if they said they liked this movie. All right, well. Michael, I appreciate your time. We appreciate your perspective. Uh, we basically created a better version of a movie that we need to workshop and go make us some. Uh, go, 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 go! Make, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna hit you up. We're gonna make. We're gonna make millions, or at least more than this movie made so far. <laughs> um, yeah, like, uh, you got anything going on that you want to tell the people about? You can always catch me on the Grio Daily. And uh, on the Grio website, writing. So catch me there, and, and you'll find out anything else you need to know. Yeah, and also, I mean, your book is still doing really well. I still see people popping up with that thing every time I go to a bookstore. I look for your book. I look for books of people that I know, and I look to see where your book is located. And it's always in a prominent position in a store. And I'm like, you know what? That's a sign that this book is doing all right. Because there are some people's books. I got to go find that thing in a section that might not match up with what the book is. Meanwhile, yours is sitting on the tables and it's in a space where you can see it when you walk in books, you should read. So you're doing all right out here. You're doing all right. Congrats on that, on that, on that, the many successes you're doing all right out here. I don't have to take a job as a magical Negro. So that's, <laughs> that's good. As long as I don't have to take a, a, a second gig as in the magical Negro universe, I'm doing well. <laughs> Sounds good. And I too am thankful that that is not my lot in life. So uh, thank you for being here. We appreciate your time. Until next time, uh, until we until we sit here talking about our magical Negro movie. Uh, thanks for listening to everybody. Thanks for, for for checking out our shows. Make sure you check out the Grio Daily with Michael Harriet. Keep listening to Dear Culture. I'm Panama Jackson. Have a black one. We started this podcast to talk about not just what Black writers write about, but how. Well, personally, it's on my bucket list to have one of my books banned. <laughs> I know that's probably bad, but Ooh. I think... Ooh, spicy. <laughs> they were yelling, N-word, go home. And I was looking around for the N-word because I knew it couldn't be me because I was a queen. <laughs> but I am telling people to quit this mentality of identifying ourselves yeah. by our work, to start to live our lives and to redefine the whole concept of how we work and where we work and why we work in the first place.
My, my biggest strength throughout throughout my career has been having incredible mentors and specifically black women. I mean, I've been writing poetry since I was like eight. You know, I've been reading Langston Hughes and James Baldwin and Maya Angelou and so forth and so on since I was like a little kid. Like the banjo was blackly black, right? Mm -hmm. For many, many, African. many years, yes. everybody knew. Cause sometimes I'm just doing some Sam because <laughs> I just want to do it. An honor to be here. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Keep shining bright. And we, and, and like you said, we gonna keep writing black. As always, you can find us on the Grio app or wherever you find your podcasts.